All right, so I'm connecting to the cloud. I can see the recording. Okay. All right, so our first speaker is uh, Fritz Zomer, who's going to talk about computation using rhythm and spikes. And um, he's been working in this area of um, neural mechanisms for perception and learning. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about this. Welcome, Thank Fritz. Thank you, Gigi. Yeah. Okay, let me share my screen. So it's a pleasure to talk here. It was a pleasure to listen to a lot of the um, to a lot of the talks, really exciting. Um, um, I'm actually with um, Mike Davis's group uh, uh, at, um, at Interlabs and also um, I'm at the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. And um, between these two, two groups, it's a quite thriving group in terms of um, thinking about uh, theoretical concepts, but also really um, more engineering concepts of how you can understand the brain. Um, let me just, can I, sorry. Okay. All right. Um, just make me a co-host and I'll mute those people. Wait, you're talking to me a sec. Uh, sorry, I'm, um, Fritz, I'm gonna make Toby the yeah. co-host so that he can mute out. So whoever is on, uh, can you mute your audio? And also, if you have questions, please ask them on Slack or on the Zoom chat, and I'll um, ask the speaker those questions or convey them. Sorry, I'm okay. just trying to find my presentation. Um, second here. Oh. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah. So, um, also I'm for quite a while in neuroscience, theoretical neuroscience. I'm quite new to Telluride. I almost made it up there, but I never did. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to make it virtually this year. And as I said, I enjoyed the talks very much. I will start my talk with um, uh, briefly um, t uh, telling you guys about uh, a neuroscience project a few years ago that really got me excited about, um, or that really convinced me that we need to build this stuff in order to understand it. It's about decoding traveling waves and hippocampus. And, um, and then I will talk about uh, uh, kind of two approaches to um, basically leverage neuromorphic uh, uh, hardware. And one is uh, uh, oscillator-based computation. It's an entire field of its own. And I will briefly tell you about the retina model <clears throat> that uses a phasal network and that, that, that kind of does a form of image segmentation and sensing at the same time. But then talk more about the foundations of how you can build really uh, networks with spike, spike, with spike timing that use spike timing and that um, are, uh, that can do robust computation that actually depends, our theory kind of depends on a, on a, on a phase or tractor network I will talk about. Then maybe tell you just briefly about um, stochastic versions of such phase or networks and amplitude phase, phase Boltzmann machine that a student in my lab did. And then switch a little bit gears and talk about the second principle of computation that uses classical superpositions we all know these, for example, um, eco-state networks, <clears throat> liquid state networks use this principle too, but also these vector symbolic architectures. I'm very grateful to Terry Stuhl who already introduced vector symbolic architectures. I will tell you briefly about the hi hippocampus place cell model that we uh, build using VSA and phasal meth uh, methods. Then about very recent stuff um, about uh, scene segmentation, also using VSA stuff. Not so much really spiking uh, neurons uh, in this particular log. And then uh, tell you a little bit about how to actually get these uh, a full VSA framework going with, with uh, on, on neuromorphic hardware. And that's it. So um, many years ago, I was sitting with um, my uh, 
former postdoc Gauta Margawal, who is actually still a, 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 in, in Berkeley, he's a, he's a researcher in the Redwood Center now, and we were looking actually here at visualizations of um, theta waves uh, recorded with a multi-electrode array in uh, the hippocampus. And uh, all he did was uh, um, filter in around 10 hertz and then put all these different channels uh, here on this, on this, on, um, in this 3D plot and let it run. And we looked at this and we said, we need to listen to it. Uh, what, what does it tell us? And so now how do you listen to that? And someone familiar with li listening to airwaves, we immediately thought, well, we need to think about how to demodulate this. So what is the carrier? And uh, then basically Gautam fi figured out what the carrier was and, um, and we could start to listen to it. And the nice thing is that basically you can just use PCA methods to, and the carrier is indeed this traveling wave. And then on top of these waves are actually phase distortions in, in these different channels of the signal. So you don't see them by eye, it looks rather smooth, but if you measure carefully, you see them. And these phase distortions carry actually information about the behavior of this navigating rat. So this is uh, recordings in a behaving rat in an, in an environment. And so you can here see on the, on the left side, these plots true positions versus estimated position. And if you look, look in the upper row, you actually can see what you can do with spikes. So it's a pretty uh, straight diagonal line, which means good, de good decoding. But if you actually use this demodulated theta signal, you, you, you get as, at least as good uh, performance. And if you uh, do this only with 50% of the 64 electrodes, you see that it's more robust, it breaks, it doesn't have these holes that you of course get if you leave away an electrode where there's a place cell that you really need. So it's kind of interesting for um, brain machine interface, but in terms of really understanding what's going on, and you can also uh, do kind of unsupervised learning on these demodulated de de uh, uh, theta waves, and you see there are, are actually, so here is basically the rat running left and here right. And you can see that for each location in, in the maze, for each running direction, you have actually here a, a place component that, that you can extract from these signals. It looks actually very distributed in the electrode space, but it, it kind of kicks in very sharply as soon as the animal is in a certain location, in a, running in a certain direction, you have it for both sides. You see actually phase precession, very similar to place fields. So here are the place cells of the, of the, of the place, uh, place cells. And you can see it's a very orderly map and uh, you see a phase precession, very similar. And the question is now, how, so, so what this tells us is that, that, is that there's a tight kind of uh, inter-connection inter, uh, between uh, these uh, structures that you see in the, in the uh, local field potentials and the spikes. And um, it doesn't make you very optimistic that you can just understand spikes on its own. It also doesn't make you very optimistic that you cannot just understand LFPs on its own also because their origin is very difficult uh, biophysically uh, because it's this, this average signal from what happens within the neurons. And that really makes, made, me, uh, made me very excited about uh, building the stuff in order to figure out how it works and, and start actually theories, how you can actually, how spikes and waves interact in order to produce um, computation. So what's the difference between the, the um, so you go back to the previous slide. Yep. It's, what's the difference between the second and the third rows versus the fourth and the fifth? Is there a particular uh, do you mean here on the right side? right side? Here versus this one, yeah, versus yeah. the, the so point yeah, this down. Is just, this is just fr looking from the side um, um, how the co coefficient of one of these place components kicks in and out as the animal runs through it. Mm -hmm. Right, and, then and this is kind time. of the same. This is just a few from above the trials. Also, you can see that's very consistent across trials that these coefficients turn on whenever the animal is in the same location. So you see these right. vertical stripes. Okay, I was talking about B, you know, the, the plots in B. 
Yeah. So the, okay, yeah, so down, one. down here, yeah. yes. And these are the neurons. These are blazed. These are basically from the 64 electrodes you can record. And by, by the way, it's not our recordings. It's actually um, data from the Busaki lab that he actually okay. shared. Um, so um, these are just the blaze, um, the blaze cells of the neurons that you okay. happen to record from these 64 electrodes. And you can also see, see they tile the space. They do it in a less orderly fashion, but it's mm. of course also good enough to actually do decoding with them. Right. Okay. You can okay. see here, these are the, the phase processions um, that you actually see for the neurons, whereas these are the phase processions that you see for the for the for these um, blaze components in the demodulated. Um, okay. So Fritz, uh, Fritz, this is Terry. Um, Terry there's right. a paradox here, which is that uh, for those that aren't <clears throat> familiar with this, the place fields are distributed in the hippocampus randomly. They're they're not organized right. in mm. an orderly row like you see in the field potential, right? Yeah. So, so there's the paradox. Why is it that the individual neurons and the field potentials don't actually uh, are you know, have different uh, spatial organization? Uh, it's it's it's. Yeah. And I think you're right. The two of them ha somehow have to be reconciled. So it, exactly. It's, so, know. so that was another puzzle. So, so for example, you can decode quite easily LFPs in uh, the visual cortex of of carnivores because you have this. You have this spatial organization that similar orientations are actually co-located in these orientation columns. And so if you average, if you record a signal near these neurons, even of some dendritic current uh, means, you very likely get a, a resulting um, orienta uh, preferred orientation and you can still actually record. It was a puzzle why you could actually decode from the local field potentials of play cells in the hippocampus the location so uh, precisely and we actually use compressed sensing to explain this so because you have a, a salt and pepper organization of different locations um, in the hippocampus so two nearby play cells encode entirely different locations and uh, in the paper, we actually, uh, we really analyzed models and we actually use compressed sensing theory to actually explain why we actually see what we see here. But anyway, let me, let me just move on if there's no other pressing questions. So um, then the question is, okay, how can you actually compute with oscillations and of course there's an entire com community doing this and there's a recent paper here that I actually I put in here the, the, the reference uh, so you can see there is uh, you know hardware people who really design substrates with coupled oscillators and so on there's people who uh, look into difficult um, uh, kind of analysis problems like um, graph clustering in let's say social networks and things like that. And they actually use coupled oscillator models to find for example, sub communities in, in, such, uh, in such communication networks. And uh, the idea is quite simple. So you have, um, you are, you have an oscillator with a, with a phase phi. Uh, so phi i is one of the oscillators and the derivative of this phase is basically computed just by an intrinsic um, frequency omega i, which could be the same for all the oscillators or slightly different, which is sometimes beneficial to keep them a little bit apart so that if they are together and block, it really means something. And then you basically have an inter a phase interaction here in form of this sine wave, which is actually a phase lock loop. If all the phi j's are similar, then basically you have your phase lock loop signal in this of this one oscillator and it will actually phase lock to the phi j's. Okay, and what you can do now is you can like what Hopfield and Tank did with Hopfield networks. You can basically program in these MIJ weights that for the Kuramoto model are real valued uh, some computational problem, and then you can basically start the oscillator phases at random and let it relax. And then, for example, here you will see subgroups of oscillators lock with each other, and um, th those then, for example correspond to these communities, sub-communities in a, in a communication network. And so we basically use this to explain a phenomenon. I cannot go into detail here, but uh, actually with Judith's lab, uh, with Judith Hurst's lab, we actually looked into um, 
the early visual pathway and we found these ongoing os uh, gamma oscillations, uh, 50 to 80 hertz, os hertz oscillations in, in the retinal output and that actually does very precise phase locking also of the LGN cells that actually transport these signals up to cortex. And so we were wondering what this fine timing precision really means. And um, a student in my lab, he actually designed a model of a sensing network like the retina where each uh, sensor has a very simple receptive field like, you know, he just measures the contrast in such a small circle or centers around, very simple. And uh, then he actually asked the question, um, can we, um, if you could adapt the, fa the, 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 the phase interactions between these different sensor cells and they would be os oscillators, could actually such a re relaxation as I just described actually pull out segments of the image? And the idea is then that the retina actually multiplexes this segmentation information. So if you just look at the rates of these, of these retinal ganglion cells that are the outputs of the retina, here's my cursor, uh, the rates represent the local contrast in the, in the receptive field, whereas actually the fine timing could actually provide this grouping information. And so uh, Chris Warner, a student of mine, he really set up, a, 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 used a, a rigorous test to actually, and asked the question, um, if you have an image like here, he used the, the, the Berkeley image segmentation database. It's a beautiful database with actually uh, natural images and then ground truth segmentation results from subjects who actually really draw borders between segments. And so we could really quantitatively ask if we actually compare a, a, a network that doesn't have these 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 phase coupled oscillators in it, and you just use the contrast histogram versus if you actually use such a, a phase coupled network, um, can you actually really gain something in terms of finding these these boundaries here between the segments? And how this actually looks if he if he pipes the image through the network you see here, so it basically it it keeps the borders very sharply. So it's not just low pass filtering, but it basically gets rid of, uh, of kind of textual information uh, within the segments very, very strongly. So in other words, it's a cartoonization of this image because the receptive fields are very simple here. You cannot really do state of the art um, image segmentation, but this could already help if this would be multiplexed with the, the gray levels of the image to the next stage that could actually help to organize the visual input stream. That was the idea of this model. Uh, and, Fritz, I have um, a, yeah. I have a question. I thought this uh, gamma oscillations uh, show up in the developing retina, but you're saying even if the retina is mature, you, you see these oscillations? Yes, yes, you do see this. And actually there's a beautiful, uh, there's uh, a lab who, who, who investigated this, uh, Tachibana in Tokyo. And they had a beautiful paper where they really showed um, that um, there is functional significance of these oscillations that was in frog and in frog uh, they, they actually could suppress pharmacologically these oscilla uh, these gamma oscillations in the in the adult frog and then show that um, the um, frog still could actually catch flies and deal with little objects but was hampered in actually his reflex to jump away in the big of in, in, in the face of big looming stimuli and, and stuff like that. So there's some indications that they have really functional implications, but no one really, I mean, it's not very well understood what the function is. And this was the purpose of this project. But let me move on if there's no other pressing questions to this. So what I explained to you so far was still a phasal network. The question is now really, how could you have this, this interactions, interaction between rhythms and spikes? And how could you actually principle networks that use spike timing, single spikes to actually communicate and um, perform robust computation? And uh, so uh, with actually Paxson Frady, who is uh, also at, uh, uh, NCL into labs and uh, also at the Redwood Center, uh, we uh, did a little journey into a tractor network land. 
and we are all familial. And so we, uh, we um, heal, basically, we organize these attractal models in the literature um, along three different um, properties of, of the state space, uh, complex values, well, complex value versus real, continuous versus discrete, and sparse patterns versus dense patterns. And so you can see that uh, the famous Hopfield network is here in this intersection. So it's, it's, uh, re it's uh, real, discrete, dense patterns. And uh, all familiar with this simple learning rule, kind of this happy um, learning rule, how you can store in one shot fashion patterns in, in the Hopfield network, simple um, null update rule using uh, here just a heavy side function and then just piping the previous state through the way, uh, symmetric weight matrix. And um, uh, after a few years later, actually it was discovered that it's very beneficial to go actually here to sparse patterns because this actually bumps up the, uh, the memory capacity of the network very much. So you get from 0.14 bits per signups to 0.72 bits per signups. So sparsity really helps. And um, we, of course, we are very interested in these phasor networks that were, were actually proposed here around the same a few years later after Hopfield's work and mainly for optical computing. And they also use a very simple um, happy and inspired learning rule. Here they use the conjugate complex so they can, uh, the nice thing of these phasor networks is really they can store um, analog valued phase patterns. They are not they are not limited to discrete, discretized data. They can store basically analog data. That's kind of very nice. But then for us, it was not so interesting because we, we basically ask, well, is there actually some work for, for actually sparse phasal networks? Because in the brain, not all the neurons spike. So you want some neurons to, to be silent, right? And you want to have a model that describes this. And interesting enough, there was no work on that. And so this is actually what we did in a 2019 paper. And uh, the model is very simple. It looks just like a phasal network in terms of the learning. You have here um, an objective function that has one additional term that has here a theta parameter, which actually is a threshold. So all what's different from a standard phasal network is that not all the phases always have amplitudes. They can have zero amplitudes if actually the postsynaptic complex sum is smaller than, a, than this threshold theta the only difference. The nice thing is you see also with these networks, this increase in the capacity in bits per signups as it goes sparse. So that was very good. But our main motivation was, of course, to use this now to really um, design spiking neural networks that are now basically governed by a similar energy function here and um, can do, for example, associative memory and uh, also error correction. And, um, and so then uh, what, we can, what you can do is you can basically, so, so let's say you have your phasal network that updates in discrete time as zero, as one and so on. And now you can basically uh, in a given in a time interval T, you can just represent all the, the input phases that a neuron sees actually in terms of presynaptic spikes. And this is basically what happens here in the standard in the standard phasal networks that we first simulated, we really had a discrete parallel update that would basically just take this block of phases here and then compute the next phases. You can also okay. Uh, let me just go back. So you can you can basically now go to a sliding window that also um, actually um, drops exponentially in, uh, with the past, and then you can basically uh, you can um, uh, you can design a neuron that 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 just sums up basic, basically all these convoluted input spikes weighted by the synaptic weights, which still could be actually complex values here. And then you have these one-sided, so this is the heavy side function, 
um, complex uh, decaying um, and oscillating uh, kernels. And the interesting thing of this equation, it's way too much now for you to, to look, but you can look at this in the paper, is that if you actually form the derivative of this equation here, it's just a resonate and fire model that was um, strongly advocated by Isikovic, but was of course around for a much longer time. And Isikovic mainly uh, analyzes this with here real valued synaptic inputs, but but uh, we were very interested in actually complex valued synaptic inputs. And in order to have guarantees for the phasal networks in terms of uh, um, attractor dynamics, the W must be Hermitian. So it's kind of the analog to the symmetry in the Hopfield weights. And um, yeah, and basically you can run this system now and, uh, and the only thing that's now different from a standard integrated in fire neuron, you have a two-dimensional membrane voltage space. So, so there's the vector that runs around in this UV plane. And you can basically see every time an input comes, the direction of this input is depends on the synaptic phase angle and of course also on the spike timing of the of the presynaptic spike you see the kick of this membrane so it goes up and then you can have a threshold mechanism or so two th threshold planes in this in this in this um, membrane um, space and um, you know and then the neuron produces a spike every time it, it actually crosses uh, a, a threshold. And the behavior that you see here, if you store patterns with this complex value Papian learning rule, is um, is is basically so this is this is basically a fixed point. So a fixed point now corresponds to a limit cycle here where each neuron is either silent or if it is active, it is actually active one per cycle. And the phase differences between different neurons or timing differences, they are actually really the stored data. And so you can see if you initialize this network with part of this pattern, then it actually relaxes like what you would expect from an associative memory. It actually relaxes here to the same pattern that, that was stored before. It's kind of the idea. Then of course, to make this, to, to run this really on a neuromorphic hardware, you don't want these complex weights. And what you basically can trade off is phase shifts in synapse basically the phase in the synapse with actually the spike timing. And so you can basically just translate a complex weight into a, the real value part of the weight. And you can put in the transformed phase angle, which is now transformed here in a time interval with respect to this, this time, time of the cycle tau. And then basically you can write down a one dimensional equation that has uh, just real valued weights and um, it's basically a convolution now just of a decaying cosine. And this shows the same behavior as the original resonating fire neuron, but can be implemented with standard integrated fire neurons. But the question is, of course, how can you Im implement this convolutional filter here? And one way to implement is a, uh, this is actually with um, is with, with uh, inhibitory neurons. So you can have actually two pools of inhibitory neurons that actually are not even, do not even need to be timed. So, so I mean, so, so these rows basically correspond, correspond now to time delays in, in, the, in the synaptic transmission. So, so this is a network that, that, that uses time delays but it's sufficient actually to have these time delays and adjust these time delays by learning in the excitatory neurons. You can ha ha have kind of a generic um, inhibition that this then up, up with some dendritic filtering basically gets you something very close to actually this, 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 uh, this, this, this cosine um, um, convolution kernel. And so now we basically can run uh, this network. So this is now regular uh, res uh, integrated and fire neurons, and, uh, but inhibitory pools to do this thing that I just explained. And then you can do the same thing. You can learn these spike timing patterns. You can, for example, encode images in them. And you can also really see that you nicely can trace actually the capacity curves of the abstract phasal network. So you really have here a network which uh, 
computes with spike times and is very robust in the sense that it has this pattern completion property and it also actually reaches the, 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 the memory capacity of, of, the, of the theoretical counterpart. Um, and um, in Mike Davis's group, we implemented uh, this network in, uh, on Loihi. Um, and now let me, let me see how I'm doing here with time. Um, yeah, you, um, I, I would okay. say the, the is which the Amplitude Boltzmann machine, you can read this here in an archive paper. So basically, uh, essentially did a very nice job in actually deriving uh, the non-linearities in this Amplitude phase Boltzmann machine and also the learning rules, it's all very, expected uh, and then he used this to learn for example here a complex wavelet transformed MNIST digits and showed that actually the invariant uh, the, 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 if, if you if you use this this encoding actually in an in a in an uh, if you use that the hidden layer of this restricted Boltzmann machine as a, as an encoding stage you actually get a a larger invariance, uh, you, you have more invariance if you just shift these uh, digits by a pixel. Also, you never learned uh, actually these shifts. Now, let me move to the second principle, which um, is a second principle of computation, which, which, which goes a little bit beyond what, what standard computers do. And this is basically uh, kind of follows the principle that also standard computers do. So you do analog computing and then you do error correction to prevent error accumulation. And you do this in a von Neumann computer bit by bit. And in many other systems, you, do, you don't do it bit by bit, but you do it basically as a, for entire patterns. And you can use these attractor networks, for example, as the error correction stage and so on. And we all know these systems, so, so echo state networks, uh, liquid state machines of this uh, type, the map seeking circuit, but also the vector symbolic architectures. And uh, Terry Stewart already talked about them. So um, here is my a short uh, spiel about them. So the idea is to compute with distributed patterns. You encode objects like symbols or also analog stuff in, uh, in um, using random patterns or some principles how you can actually use random patterns. These random patterns are then also stored in a content addressable memory, which is used for the error correction. And then the idea is that you have actually an algebraic structure on this distributed representation. You have um, usually two types of, of um, operations. You have an addition operation, a multiplication operation. You can combine these two and actually uh, do two incomplete computations of stuff. And this is basically what you do. You will end up with a result which is noisy. And then you actually use these content addressable memories for doing the cleanup. You can use these systems to um, solve, uh, you know, uh, optimization problems that require quite a bit of search. And then usually the strategy is really you, you uh, in the course of the, the computation, you get this messy superposition of solutions and then you somehow narrow it down to the solution. And, um, and one application of this is actually uh, uses um, these principle also um, a phase on network. And, um, for example, for in the hippocampus, let's come back to these play cells. You have an animal which moves here in this XY plane. You take now just a sparse random phasor vector um, a, to encode X positions, another for Y positions, context like, you know, different environments. And now you form basically the internal uh, representation of the by using this circular convolution. Uh, that uh, Terry uh, already explained. And you use this exponentiation trick that Terry also explained. And actually, this is not new. We used this years ago um, in, in this model. And uh, so basically, you exponentiate with respect to the circular convolution, these vectors that represent, re represent the two cardinal positions, basically, by the actual location. That's all you do. And 
you can now represent this by spiking neurons. And then actually you find out that if these X and Y vectors are sparse enough, you will actually really see blaze cells. You, you get kind of really uh, neurons that are tuned to certain blazes, like here, these two examples. And you also see phase precession. And um, this is also comes from this exponentiation trick. So, so it basically, if you move only a small uh, distance on this 2D plane, then the same set of neurons stays active, but their phases change slightly. And so the nice thing is that this is a very simple kind of normative model of the, of the hippocampus that we are right now refining uh, and uh, that kind of explains um, these two elements that are kind of critical in, 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 in place cell codes. So now let's come back to using vector symbolic architectures for, for, for something more challenging. So in many, in many problems, actually in the computational problems, you, uh, if you cast them in vector symbolic architectural operations, you end up with a factorization problem. So you are given a vector, and I will show in the next slide, this could, for example, describe a scene, a visual scene. Now you have several objects, and each object is kind of known, and you have it in a dictionary, and these are these, these x1, x2, xf, so these are dictionaries, so you know that each factor comes from one of the dictionaries, but you don't know what instances here actually uh, multiply up to this s. And so it's a, it's a combinatorial search problem. And we de de designed a network called the resonator network that does something like these hot field cleanups, but in addition uses these, multi these, these multiplication operations. And so, so in every step, you basically use the two other guesses. So, so let's say, say here, you use the Y and the C guess to actually unbind from the given input S, which is fixed and given to you, the best X, that's the best compatible with what you have stored for the X pedals, right? And then you iterate this through the different factors. And what is very interesting is that this network actually beats all other optimization methods that uh, actually Spencer had, has tried on this, on, uh, on, on this problem. So, so if, you, if you ask what is the number of combinations you can actually solve, you can actually factorize with a certain size, given a certain size of these vectors, of the, they are all the same dimension, and you use here the Hadamard product, that's the, 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 the multiplication operation. Then it turns out that actually resonator network can, um, for example, for, 15, for dimension 1500, you can solve here about 10 to the 6 combinations, whereas all the other optimization methods do much worse. Uh, so Fritz, uh, guess, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. Would we, uh, we might have to finish in five minutes or so? Is yeah, that that's possible? fine. That's perfect. Okay. All right. Because yeah. uh, we could do yeah. more during the informal q &A. Okay. So in this house shows now this resonator on action. And I should say here, no spiking neurons here. So this is still work in progress that I, I will address in, in the end how to do this with spiking at all. So these are dense representations. And you can see that uh, there are this... Uh, an input in image that has different objects, different letters that have different attributes like color um, and position. You again use this, this exponentiation trick here to encode actually the position of these different, let of, of these different letters. And, and then you can see how the resonator starts with many, uh, many guesses at the same time and then somehow hones in onto one combination. And so, so basically in this sum of different products of stuff, it always focuses on one and then factorizes each of the three objects in terms of its attributes, uh, letter identity uh, and um, location. And the question is now, um, so in, in the current resonator circuit, we operate with dense vectors. They can be complex. They can also be actually bipolar. Uh, it doesn't matter, it, uh, um, but 
the question is now, how can you actually implement something like this on your morphic hardware? And it turns out that actually the, these, the VSA binding operation is not easy to actually transfer to sparse vectors. Uh, so there are, this has been shown in earlier papers. We have a recent paper here that actually really uh, analyzes the theory of what you want for these binding operations and also what the previous suggestions have done. Uh, and the problem is um, all these component-wise operations like the Hadamard product don't make sense for sparse vectors. So you really, if you have two sparse vectors, you need this needs to create another sparse vector that has a different support than each of the two vectors because they shouldn't be similar in terms of, of the inner product. And so the best operation um, that we found is actually to use circular convolution uh, in, in codes that have a certain block structure. So basically each vector consists of equal uh, segments of kind of a winner take all population. And in what you can do then, then you can actually do a circular convolution convolution in each of the blocks and that it works very fine and lossless actually for the binding and unbinding operation. But the problem is if you superimpose and create these mess, these kind of messy superpositions, what you want to do in the resonator circuit that I've just shown to you, you get this spike con congestion because you, you just add up a lot of, of sparse patterns and you get something which is very non-sparse. And therefore our current way to go about this is really to um, rather than to superimpose the spikes, to superimpose actually within the neurons. And so have basically neurons with a rich enough inner life where you can form these superpositions of of, of, of different solutions that you're still in the course of actually narrowing down to the best, to, to, to the real solution, you can represent them internally. And that's also of course compatible with, the, with this decoding that we can, can actually do in just looking at uh, local field potentials. And so our current version of this model actually uh, is uh, uses just uh, resonating fire neurons, very similar to what I showed you. The only difference is that the convolutional filters that convert the presynaptic spikes into the postsynaptic signals now basically form analytic signals from these spike inputs. And if you're not familiar with analytic signals, I cannot really explain it to you, but it's a signal that you usually in signal process, processing, you can actually form these signals. It's, a, it's complex. It's, you can make a real a, a analytic signal for a real signal by basically deleting the spectrum of the negative frequencies. And it's a very convenient signal to extract uh, instantaneous frequencies, amplitudes, and phases. Yeah, I think we cannot do it. It's, we can do that during the discussion. I don't think if somebody right. doesn't know, we will, yeah, try to explain right. it properly. Just let me, uh, you know, what you can do with this neuron then is basically a signal, a, a single neuron replaces then basically this an entire winner take all population in block code VSA. Um, the superposition is presented by in internal states of the on the membrane, not spikes. And, um, and another interesting property of, the, of, this, of this model is that the effect of the synaptic input is state dependent, which really corresponds to vol voltage gated channels and also to dendritic backpropagation of spikes, which is now done in, here in, in this model actually to do computation or to do learning. You also, of course, can use these signals for learning. And um, another interesting property is that you get this, this plasticity independent information routing. So basically a neuron can tune in or out to a certain information stream just by changing its own phase. And you can do this communication through coherence, which was actually propagated, um, which was, was kind of put forward in the neuroscience community of how these functional networks could quickly establish in the brain to perform a particular task and switch to another task and stuff like that. Okay, so um, to sum up, um, I hope my introduction uh, showed you that there's very interesting observations in neuroscience that actually uh, 
suggest this tight interaction between rhythms and spikes in the brain. And so probably also neuromorphic engineering should actually look into what you can do with these rhythms. I showed you uh, this retina model, which uses uh, these phasal interactions. It's a very simple, just a Kuramoto-like style model. I basically showed you these new types of uh, um, of um, phase state attractor models that actually um, can uh, process um, sparse at, um, phasal patterns, um, which can be nicely um, actually mapped onto uh, spiking neural networks, <coughs> either standard integrating fire neurons with EI populations or resonating fire neurons. Um, then I showed you uh, I showed you a little application of this actually of a, of a place cell model that produces place cells in, uh, um, in phase possession. Um, then I switch gear a little bit and showed you that actually in VS in vector symbolic architectures you can kind of use these messy superpositions to actually solve optimization problems quite efficiently. In the last part, I just lined out a little bit where we are currently thinking that this is going in terms of implementing such full uh, uh, VSA schemes in, 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 uh, on neuromorphic hardware. So let me just thank my colleagues at Intel Labs and at the Redwood Center, uh, which really, uh, I mean, this intersection is a very thriving environment. Um, and let me then end by just putting up some references for all this stuff that probably overfed uh, most of you. So I apologize for that, but um, and look forward thank to you. question. Yes, thank you, Fritz. Yeah, um, I think in the interest of time, uh, could we push the questions to the informal discussion? Would that be okay, Fritz? Sure. Would you be able to stay for it? I will try to arrange okay, it. Okay, that would be lovely. Yeah, then you could probably show some of the slides again because there, there is something, some interesting stuff that, um, yeah, would take more time at the moment. Okay, so. Okay, Gigi, just remind you to stop the recording. Yes, I'm going to do it right now. And speakers, please remember you're supposed to do.